Welcome to the channel, my name's Rob and I am exploring everything Australia. And did you know there was an Australian man called Jack Lang who almost started a civil war? Well, let's find out a little bit more about him. Sometimes the most interesting parts of history can be hidden in plain sight. Australian history, both as a country and as an island, are criminally overlooked, despite the fact that there are many fascinating events and people within it. I thought for today's video I'd talk about perhaps one of the most interesting Australians who has ever lived, but he's not very well known outside of Australia. Talking about different characters of Australia, I have previously looked at all of the characters and the people, I don't know why I said characters, the people on the Australian dollars. So you can always go back and check out that playlist. There are some fantastic, fascinating people that have come from Australia. He is perhaps one of the most controversial and powerful politicians to have ever existed in Australia, and his name is Jack Thomas Lang. Never Jack Thomas Lane was the premier of the state of New South Wales, which is Australia's most populous state. Premier is basically being in charge of a state within its parliamentary system. New South Wales as a state has always been an important one, as they've always had somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of Australia's total population, in the same way how Ontario is for Canada. But enough about demographics, let's talk about Jack himself. Jack Thomas Lane was born in 1876 in Sydney, Australia, son of a Scottish and Irish immigrant couple. Due to his father getting sick and his family not being in the best financial situation, he took multiple jobs supporting his family at a young age, selling newspapers, and then later as a poultry farmer, a horse-drawn carriage driver, a bookstore worker, and an accounting assistant. Oh, and all of that was before he was even 18. During these years, his experience living in the slums of Sydney not only caused him to be sympathetic towards his fellow people in poverty, but it motivated him to change things so people wouldn't have to experience this kind of lifestyle. In the 1890s, Australia experienced a banking crash that shook up the economy and this caused Lane to become interested in politics, and during this time the Labour Party formed in Australia. Lane would read many Labour newspapers and at the age of 19 married his wife, and also converted to Catholicism. Lang then became a manager of a real estate firm trying to help families escape the overcrowded slums, but it wouldn't be long before he'd get into politics himself by running for office. Okay, straight away, he seems like a good person. He's he's going into politics for the right reasons. And this sort of... This sort of... I'm, I'm hoping it doesn't all turn to pot. Um, but he's coming from a working class background. He knows what it's like to have to work hard and he wants to make life better for people. So he then goes into politics. I just, I'm just worried now. I'm worried that like most politicians, it goes, they go in for the good and it goes a little bit haywire. In the early 1900s, he took a few local political jobs and eventually became mayor of a town called Auburn outside of Sydney in 1909. Auburn. In 1913, Lane became a member of the parliament for New South Wales, now entering into state level politics. He couldn't have picked a more interesting time though, as World War I started a year later and this forever shook Australian politics. World War I had brought up an issue that divided politicians, including the Labour Party itself, overseas conscription. At the time, there was conscription for the defense of Australia, but that didn't include anything about overseas operations like fighting in Europe. So the Labour Prime Minister of Australia, Billy Hughes, tried to get the public to vote for a change in the law's wording to allow for such a thing, believing that it was important that Australia supported Great Britain during World War I. The Labour Party then expelled Hughes from the party, causing Hughes to rally pro-conscription Labour members to unite with conservative Liberal Party members to form a new party called the Nationalist Party. Oh, that's painful. Um... <laughs> It, I, I suppose at this time, Australia it's still got that huge connection to Great Britain, right? It's still a huge connection. But I do think there probably were people that were starting to think, uh, you know, maybe we don't, you know, maybe we shouldn't be helping Great Britain. And, um, you know, we shouldn't be joining other people's wars. And actually now with with recent discussions about obviously Australia become a republic, maybe it's not all new. Maybe it was happening back in the early 19th century. Jack Lane was anti-conscription and refused to leave the party, which meant many positions in the New South Wales Labour Party political system suddenly opened up for him. 
Jack Lane would become treasurer of New South Wales in 1920, inheriting a post-World War I deficit. He managed to significantly reduce the deficit despite Labour's support of social programs, making him a respected figure. However, Labour lost New South Wales in 1922, and after a leadership change, Lane was finally the new leader of the New South Wales Labour Party. And in 1925, he was elected Premier of the state, having a majority by just one seat. Lane would now go from a respected upstart of a politician to a much more controversial one. Mm -hmm. Jack Lane in his first term started as a typical labor politician in which he supported increased social programs and pro-worker policies. However, Good. there were several notable things that Lane did that were new for New South Wales at the time. State pensions for widowed mothers with dependent children under the age of 14 were implemented. There is also now a system of mandatory workers' compensation for any death, illness, or injury on the job. And the work week was reduced to only 44 hours. And public high schools were now free. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting because they are quite socialist. You know, if it's similar to our Labour, it's a, it's a socialist Labour Party. And those are the sort of things you expect from a from a Labour Party. Now, obviously, maybe this was going further than what Labour had done before. You know, it's like over here when we had Jeremy Corbyn, who I thought was actually quite good. Um, people didn't. That's fine. Um, but he got the young people really interested. But I think his problem was he tried, and this was when we're in the opposition, it was a case of doing too much at once. And and that can be overwhelming. And and maybe this was this was similar. Although um, he was the premier, maybe this was similar. It's it's too much all at once for people to to accept. If it was one or two things, it's easier to um, to agree with. But it's the problem always with the socialist parties like Labour. I'm a Labour supporter. It's that people know roughly what Labour stands for. It's helping everyone. It, it, it's it's not saying to rich people, we don't want you to be rich. We want you to be really rich so you can pay the taxes that you deserve to, you know, you should be paying. Um, and it's it's if you work hard, you should, you should be able to achieve. But Labour, for example, is known for spending money. And no matter what happens... People always always think, well, where are you getting that money from? And it's understandable. That, that's not a problem. That's understandable. So when it's looking here, for example, um, state pensions for widowed mothers with children under 14, um, system of mandatory working compensation, 44-hour week, making public schools, uh, high schools free, so p turning a public school to a, high, uh, to a state school. Well, those things are going to cost money. Um, and so where are you getting that money from? And there are answers, there are answers, um, but a lot of people who then oppose it don't necessarily want to look at the answers. So I can understand why that came, became quite controversial. Actually, you look at it now and it's not very controversial, is it? Yes, it was a different time in which public high schools actually cost money like college did. Lane also funded several projects such as the building of two major highways in New South Wales called the Hume Highway and the Great Western Highway, but the most notable achievement was Lane introducing universal suffrage to New South Wales elections at the local level. Beforehand, you had to own property to participate in mm. local council elections, but Lane thought that that was ridiculous, so he changed that. Of course it is. So far, these things either seem normal or positive, so when did Lane get so controversial exactly? Well, it all started when he tried to abolish the upper house of the New South Wales Parliament. So, the upper house of the New South Wales Parliament was called the Legislative Council. It's kind of like the equivalent of a Senate. Lane wanted it gone, and as you can imagine, this caused great controversy in New South Wales, and it alienated a lot of politicians. But why would Lane want to dissolve a democratic institution like this? I assume it's not the same as our House of Lords. Our House of Lords is completely ridiculous and shouldn't exist. It's not democratic. It's it's meant to be experts in fields, not actual fields of grass. Um, but you know what I mean. Um, but it's pointless. But I'm going to assume it's not the same because this is talking about it being democratically elected. That's not like the Lords, which is stupid. Well, his argument was that it wasn't democratic. 
The Legislative Council, despite being an equivalent to a Senate, is not like the US Senate where the members are elected. Rather, it's closer to something like the UK's House of Lords, where all the members are appointed by the lower house and could stay there for life. Okay, so I don't know why he, why he said that. Anyway, it's like the House of Lords. Completely pointless. We should be abolishing ours. Um, there's been discussions recently over here of, of abolishing the House of Lords because what do they do? They don't do anything, do they? I, I'm really not sure. They're not elected. You know, we've just had we've just had situations where people like Boris and all that have just given people um, a, a spot on the House of Lords, and you're just saying just before he buggers off. Um, it's just, it's, it is wrong. So I completely agree with Jack Lang on this one. Lane believed that because of these lifetime positions, the Legislative Council was full of old-fashioned politicians that were anti-social programs and hindering progress without yeah, a democratic mandate in the first place. His solution was that the law technically allowed for him to appoint additional members to the council without an election as long as he had approval of the British appointed colonial governor of New South Wales. Jack Lane then considered packing the council until it could vote itself out of existence, and Lane did in fact appoint 25 new members, and they did put up a vote of self-abolition, but it somehow still narrowly failed and the Governor General had to intervene to stop Jack Lane from appointing even more members. Soon afterwards, the citizenry of New South Wales thought that Jack was perhaps going a bit too far. Jack Lane not only failed to abolish the Legislative Council, but failed to win re-election in 1927. Some people thought that Jack Lane's career would now be over, but the Great Depression arrived, which would make Lane more prominent than ever before. During the Great Depression, the New South Wales government under Nationalist Party leader Thomas Bovin decided to respond to the Depression by cutting the popular social programs that Lane had implemented. Lane, as opposition leader, would ran against Bovin's cut by pointing out that cutting programs designed to help the desperate back on their feet doesn't exactly help the desperate people back on their feet, or solve any of the problems that caused the Great Depression in the first place either. And in 1930, that worked because Jack Lane was re-elected in what was considered a landslide. Back in the game. He now Premier of New South Wales once again. Lane did not hesitate to reinstate any removed social programs, and made sure minimum wage would remain in place. He also passed laws restricting landlords' abilities to expel tenants in an effort to halt increasing homelessness. Lane then proposed a plan to combat the Great Depression, which included a provision in which the gold standard would be replaced with a good standard meaning that the value of the Australian dollar would be pegged to the amount of goods that Australia could produce, and the idea was that this would encourage a buildup of industry and make more jobs. But this would be rejected. Nevertheless, Lane's commitment to keeping New South Wales social programs alive kept him very popular among his constituents. Lane also, of course, once again tried to abolish the Legislative Council, and once again failed, but regardless, Lane had appointed enough members to where he effectively controlled both houses now anyway. When critics denounced Lane as communist, Lane, in a similar vein to Huey Long, denounced communism, believing that his programs were actually preventing communism, not supporting it. It makes me so angry. I'm sure I've said this on a previous video on, on a different subject. <sighs> when, when, um, when the right side of politics or working class people that are a little bit racist, so vote for the right side, um, want to throw an argument at socialism, they will use communism or Marxism as a sort of a, that's what you really are. And that's just clearly not the case. It's, it's clearly not the case. Just think, socialism brought the NHS. Yes, it's a bit of a mess at the moment, but that's because of poor management. But otherwise... Um, it's it's it makes me so angry because it's it's not communism. We want people to work hard to earn money so they can pay more tax, which then helps more people. And uh, he seems like a decent guy. <laughs> What helped his case was that the Australian Communist Party denounced him and called him a social fascist. <laughs> Lane supporters then adoringly used the slogan, Lane is better than Lenin, in support of him. Of course, the real fascists in Australia naturally didn't like Lane either. An Australian fascist group known as the New Guard was formed in response to Jack Lane's popularity and would conduct violent clashes by attacking labour meetings all across New South Wales. 
This actually caused labor supporters to form defense militias to combat the New Guard. Some of these groups had admittedly some pretty cool names, such as the Workers' Defense Army and the Labor Defense Corps. And the fascist New Guard caused even more trouble when they also managed to make enemies of the New South Wales Police Department, as several of their attacks resulted in many officers being injured or killed. Stop it again. It's really interesting because what you, these things that were happening in the 1930s have recently happened. Look at Brexit, for example. You've you, in in the UK. You've had um, the Brexit pie. You've had the one that Farage was in. You know, you've, you exactly the same thing. Uh, you know, we've got a left, centre, and right, and then you've got a few others. But we keep getting new parties forming that are further right than the Conservatives. And it just, they keep coming. They come and they go. They come and they go. They come and they go. And uh, it's its the same type of people. It is the same type of people. And it's just, it's frustrating and laughable at the same time. Rumors spread about a new guard plan to kidnap Jack Lang, but Lang was never worried. Considering he now had both citizen militias and the police force firmly supporting him, it's not that hard to understand Lang's sense of security. In 1932, Jack Lang decided to cause some controversy with the opening of the new Sydney Harbour Bridge. Whenever a new public works construction was finished, it was custom for the ribbon cutting ceremony to be conducted by the colonial governor. Jack Lane decided to just cut the ribbon himself. <laughs> However, there was an incident referred to as the De Groot incident, in which a member of the new guard named Francis De Groot rode in on horseback and cut the ribbon to steal Jack Lane's thunder. <laughs> the police arrested De Groot, and a new ribbon was put in place, and they started the ceremony all over. Lane then cut the ribbon to an adoring crowd before the governor gave his speech. Jack Lane's cutting of the ribbon was something that the public didn't really have an opinion on, but it did irritate a few members of government. But soon enough, Jack Lane's premiership would face an outright crisis. Later that year in 1932, the federal government under Prime Minister Joseph Lyons decided to cut or suspend social programs to balance the budget. Even though Lane was the premier of New South Wales, the national government had the ability to intervene in the state's budget if debt was involved. Prime Minister Lyons decided to intervene by taking the money going to the workers running the social programs. Although the Australian court sided with the Prime Minister over Jack Lang, Jack Lane refused to comply. Jack Lane's reasoning was that the British Empire banned slavery, and if you're having social workers work without pay, then that's slavery. To prevent Lyons from forcibly taking the tax money, Lane withdrew all the state funds in cash from government bank accounts wow. and literally locked it up in a guarded building. This caused a constitutional crisis, and the governor of New South Wales, despite admitting to liking Jack Lane, intervened and dismissed Jack Lane as premier, meaning he was basically fired. Wow. So I, I think, in my opinion, obviously I'm centre left. Okay, Jack Lang was was right in in his motives, in his beliefs. I, in my opinion, he was right, and other, others will believe he wasn't right. That's fine. Um, and we've all got opinions, and they are just like ourselves. Remember that everyone's got one. Um, but. He clearly, oh, that is a bold, bold move, isn't it? To take all the money out and just lock it up so no one else... It's like, if you can't have it, then no one's having it. Uh, <laughs> God. Bold move. In the book 1932, author Gerald Stone states that there is a brief proposition within Lane's government to simply arrest the Governor General and stay in power anyway. While there is no official record of any such proposition, Jack Lane in his autobiography, The Turbulent Years, did confirm himself that it was a brief consideration. While it never happened, it was something that the national government worried about well enough to put the armed forces of Australia on alert. If Lane would have arrested the Governor General, it could have started a whole civil war in Australia. Since the New South Wales police force at the time had the same manpower as the Australian Federal Army, this would have been a very serious conflict. And that's still not including the fact that Jack had supporter militias, and that wow. New South Wales geographically surrounded the federal capital of Canberra. Regardless- Canberra? Oh, that's painful. Can I just say, Aussies, this is what you're turning into. Canberra? Sorry if that's upset people. Camera. 
regardless of the heavy what-ifs involving this situation, the reality was that Lane was no longer Premier of New South Wales. After Jack Lane's dismissal, he was somehow still able to run for office, but Jack Lane went his own way by splitting from the Labour Party, forming Lane Labour. However, his departure from the Labour Party meant that the Labour vote was now split, so mm. Lane Labour failed to win the 1932 election. The same thing happened again in 1935, which prompted the federal-level Labour leader and future Prime Minister John Curtin to reach out and reconcile with Jack Lane to reunify the party. However, this would only last until 1940, when Jack Lane seceded from Labour again, forming the Non-Communist Labour Party. <laughs> the Non-Communist Labour Party. It's like, please don't label us as communists, we're not, I promise but reunified with John Curtin again in 1941. The constant shenanigans, as well as Lane's refusal to cooperate with Labour over and over, resulted in his outright expulsion from the party in 1943. Lane then decided to restart the non-communist Labour Party and try an election at the federal level instead, but his party only won two seats in the 1944 and 47 elections. Jack Lane would lose his own seat in 1949 and would never win an election ever again. Jack Lane by the 1950s was done with politics, and in 1975, Jack Lane would finally die wow. at the old age of 98. So overall, we have a politician who was as gutsy and powerful as Huey Long, and who almost brought a civil war to Australia, yet for some reason among famous politicians, he's not really that well known outside of Australia. Heck, he doesn't even have his own story in Kaiserreich yet, and they bring up every obscure person. But, his story is an example on just how insane the political world was during the 20s and 30s, and hopefully this video was entertaining enough to convince some of you to study up on Australian history. I... he seems like a bloody decent bloke. Age 98 he, he lived to, that is um, a good age to live. Um, uh, fair play. No, I, I, he, was, he was clearly gutsy. His beliefs were... Fairly similar to mine, there may be some things that I disagree with, but from, from this video, a lot of his beliefs were similar to mine. Um, and straight away, that makes it right. <laughs> um, but it's interesting to see what was radical then and isn't radical now, uh, because we, be you know, most of the time we would believe it's fairly normal. But he had guts, right? He, he, he stood by what he believed in. He clearly cared about people. That's the main thing. Surely that is what you want from a politician. You want a politician to care about the people, the majority of the people, and if not everyone, you should. And we're in a situation over, over in the UK. We've got the last, what, 12, 13 years of conservative government. They clearly don't care about the people. They care about their mates and the rich. And and it's it's nice to see that there are moments where you get people that go into politics for the right reasons because they want to make things better for people. And clearly Jack Lang did that. And he had some balls, right? He had some balls. He, he, he saw something happen that he didn't agree with and he stepped up to the plate. Interesting. Uh, really fascinating one on Jack Lang, the Australian who almost started a civil war. Do you know about Jack Lang? Is he a character that you've ever heard of? He's not one I've ever heard of until now. If you enjoyed this video, though, please do like and subscribe and uh, I'll catch you next time.